Well, good morning. It's good to have you with us. Today, we're going to look at one of the miracles of Jesus Christ. And in this, as we go through it, he also uh, outlines how we come through uh, and prepare ourselves to receive a miracle from God. Uh, because we tend to use the owner's manual as a guide, uh, it is very clear on how God works in our life. So this morning we're going to look at one more way that uh, Jesus Christ teaches us to walk with God. Now in this miracle we're looking at, it's one of the more popular, probably the most popular miracle. It's the only one that's recorded four times in the scriptures. And it was a high impact miracle, primarily because everybody saw it and thousands were there. And so <laughs> it spread through the country like wildfire what Jesus had done. And this is the one that we would refer to as the feeding of the 5,000. Well, well, the 5,000 men, if you have 5,000 men in that culture, you probably had at least, and probably more, 5,000 women and uh, probably as many kids. So you're looking at 10, 15, up to 20,000 people on the hillside that Jesus fed with the lunch of a little boy. So as we look through how he operated in that circumstance, we also learn how we can uh, set ourselves up to receive something from God. And that we often are in a place where our life derails, comes off the rails, where we get into a situation where really about all that's going to get us out of this is a divine intervention. All that's going to get us over this or past this is God has to step in and do something that only God can do. You tracking with me? If you get there, you will know that he sometimes does this just to build up our trust in him and to stretch our faith as we walk with him. So out of here, we find four uh, key essentials that we can practice in order to receive a miracle. We can't do any miracles, but we can put ourselves in a place where it makes it easy for God to work in our life. Do you have your bulletin with you this morning? Would you take it out and read the first uh, scripture there with me? When Jesus saw the large crowd, have you got that? Let's read it together, and I'd appreciate it if you read it so loud, you wake up the person next to you, and if you startle them bad enough, they'll stay awake for the whole message. Let's read it together. When Jesus saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, so he began teaching them. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. Send the people away so they can go and buy something to eat. But Jesus answered, You give them something to eat. They said, That would take eight months' wages. <laughs> we always look at what we can do in our power, and sometimes Jesus, just to annoy us, says, you do the impossible. And we talked a few weeks ago about his teaching technique where he constantly was challenging the disciples to do something only he could do. And so once again, he's using the same teaching technique and he says, you feed them. Which, of course, in human strength would have been, I don't know, maybe possible, but not very likely. And so he set them up for the fact that they couldn't do it and what was about to happen could only be done by him. So if you need a miracle in your marriage, in your finances, in your work, in your relationships, what is the first thing that we need to do? <laughs> now, if you look at this in your bulletin, the first thing you need to do is admit you have a need. <laughs> in our culture, <laughs> we're fiercely independent and we don't like to admit that starting point, God, I need help. And yet, if we're going to interact with God, if he's going to come to us and help us, 
We have to admit our problems. Our temptation is to hide our problems, to blame our problems on somebody else, or just flat out pretend the problems don't exist. And yet the first principle we see here is that God doesn't operate until we ask him to do it. 20 times, I, 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 when I was getting ready, 20 times, you and I are told, 20 times, ask and you'll receive. And once he put it like this, you simply don't have it because you never ask for it. So as we start, admit the need, <clears throat> And so we come to God and we say, God, I have a problem. I have a need in my life. And God has set up his creation so that he doesn't parachute in and interferes, but he gave us dominion with him. And everything that he does, he does with us. And so if he's going to work a miracle, first he has to get you to the place where we say to him, I need a miracle. We usually trip into three rather self-defeating behaviors, uh, one of them being we procrastinate, we put it off, and I would say the disciples, we see a little bit of procrastination here. It says it was late in the day. They're in a desert. They got 20,000 people in front of them. It's problem obvious that sooner or later these people are going to get hungry, and I don't know Quite often when a crowd of people get hungry, they get mean. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> there's no McDonald's. It, it, there's a problem coming. And it's been coming for hours. And finally, it <laughs> by this time, it's late in the day and you have a real problem. Problem with procrastination is it doesn't solve anything. It just makes the crisis worse. And so now they got not a lot of time, a large crowd, and they need a lot of food. Anytime we delay, we just complicate what it is that has to be solved. Second of all, of another self-defeating habit is that a lot of people pass the buck and they blame other people. Uh, well, their solution was, hey, look, it's not my problem. I didn't ask these people here. Send them home. Send them away. <coughs> uh, they came of their own free will. Uh, <coughs> they came to hear you and... Let them go to McDonald's and buy some Happy Fries. So get them out of here, but it's not our problem. It's not my fault. And so often, it's not my fault. My mother weaned me too young, and since then I've been impressed to kill everybody that I see. So we blame somebody else for who we are, and we blame other things or circumstances. This is not my fault. If you're in a place where you need help, admit it, I need help, <clears throat> and it's me, and there's no way out of this. God, I need you to intervene now. Thirdly, the self-defeating behavior that we do is we worry about our problems, and uh, <coughs> worry is a type of negative prayer, and uh, it also is self-defeating because if we were praying instead of worrying, we'd have a lot less to worry about. <laughs> And uh, they're worrying. They got a problem. It's like eight months of wages to pay for this. They did a cost analysis. They got out their spreadsheet. That's a spiritual thing to do. And uh, they said, see this column? This is bread. This is muffins. This is coffee. Eight months. <clears throat> and uh, so how are we going to transport the food out here? How are we going to keep it warm while we get it? Who's going to clean up this mess? Who's going to pay for the liability insurance? Jesus, what are you thinking? And so they went into worry mode in hyper gear, and they forgot who was sitting right in front of them. It was Jesus Christ who had the power, and they're looking for Colonel Sanders. <laughs> We enter a problem often and we forget we're children of God with access to his presence who told us 20 times, ask me, I'm waiting, let me help you. And so Jesus is the guy who can turn stones into bread. He can make it rain bread. He's done that before. He can do any of those things and rather than asking him to solve it, they said, send them home. 
So first of all, you need to admit you have a need, avoid self-defeating behaviors, and secondly, I need to assess what it is that I already have. What do I have that God can do? Take a realistic analysis of our resources, and we ask ourselves, there's the problem, what do I have? And so Jesus said, let's do an assessment here. How many loaves do we have? What do we have out there? And when they found out, it was five loaves and three uh, loaves and fishes. He had uh, five small loaves and two fishes. Now, they were probably dried sardines. <clears throat> I don't know how many people thank Jesus for multiplying dried sardines, but they were hungry. <laughs> and so, rather than creating new food out of nothing, which he had done before, he took what there was there and he made it work. And uh, so as we're going to start looking for God to intervene, we need to look at what we already have. So you need to admit that you have a need. You assess, assess what you have to work with. And that second principle is that God always starts a miracle with what we have. And so we worry sometimes about if I had a million bucks, I could solve this. Well, with what you have in Jesus Christ, you can still solve it, but you have to ask him. And uh, you take your energy and you give it to him. You take your time and you offer to him. You take your money, you take your relationships, whatever you have, and uh, you offer it to him. And you say to God, this is all that I have. And notice uh, Jesus was saying, after they got the five little barley loaves and the two wonderful dried sardines, he says, okay, feed them. You see, what Jesus is always jerking our chain. Why? We're locked into a way of thinking that's not compatible with the power of our faith. We're locked into a paradigm which results in a non-spectacular life. But Jesus said, I've come to show you an abundant way to live. And he takes the little bit that he have, and so he says to the disciples, go ahead, feed them. And they're going, yeah, right. Let me see, 15, 20,000, five barley cakes. Right. Hey, uh, Andrew, go ahead, start feeding them. And... Uh, <clears throat> Why don't you take care of the problem? He's saying to the disciples. And the disciples' response, can't. It's impossible. And that's exactly a good place to be in. Humanly, of course it was impossible. Financially, they didn't have a lot of money. What little they had, Judas was using for his Hawaii fund. So... It was practically and realistically, and the spreadsheet confirmed it was impossible. We can't do this. God is never afraid to ask you to do something that's impossible for you because he wants you to see that it's always possible for him. And we have to realize we're God. He's God. We're not. And he puts us into a place where he gets to be God and we get to be his children. And he's stretching our faith and he's testing it. In fact, it says right there, John, is, when he recorded it, he says, Jesus asked this only to test them because he already knew what he was going to do. So there's a problem, they're sweating it, and he had the solution, but he was waiting for them to come on the journey and understand what he was about to do. It was impossible for them, but very easy for him. So <laughs> he sets it up, why don't you do it? And the reason is because I can't. We often find ourselves in places we can't. We get a phone call in the middle of the night someone's ill. We're standing by the bed. This is impossible. We can't do this. This is out of our control. Our heart's racing, our adrenaline's pumping, you know, to get a call. There's been an accident. My dad used to get those on a regular basis. <laughs> and uh, uh, David's in the ditch again. <laughs> and uh, or we go to work and they're passing up pink slips. They're downsizing. You get a call from school and it says, uh, we got a problem with your son, and you say, 
big deal, so do I. <laughs> and uh, part of what makes these a problem is they're a crisis because we weren't expecting them. But I know who was ready and expecting it and already knows what he's going to do. And that person is our Father God, and Jesus Christ is already on the way. He knows the answer before we know there's a problem. You have to live your life knowing that problem you're looking at only caught you off guard. It's not like the sign outside the, the uh, palm reader. <laughs> it went bankrupt. I didn't see that coming. God sees it coming, and he's ready. <laughs> so here's what we do. Number one, we admit, I, this is impossible. I can't do it. Uh, we say, here's what we have to work with. This is my talent. This is my ability. This is my wealth. This is my time. This is all I have, and I'm offering it to you. And number three, once we do the assessment, we give him what we have in our hands. Now, <laughs> God will take whatever we have. Uh, he didn't need five barley loaves and two fish. But what he did need was us to give it to him as an act of faith and the fact that we trust him. I'm thinking that out of a crowd of 15,000 or 20,000 or whatever, someone there packed a more fancy lunch. There was someone there with a lean cuisine and brie and French bread and maybe a little vino. And, uh, but the boy was the hero because he offered what he had. He's not the hero because he had the biggest lunch or the best lunch. He's the hero because this is all that I have, but Jesus, you can have it. And uh, that's why he became the hero. So the third principle is that we offer it, but God uses whatever we give him. And notice the next, uh, the verse there that says... Uh, <clears throat> On point three, Jesus took the five loaves, two fish, he blessed the food, he broke the loaves, and look at that, see that underlined? He kept giving them to the disciples. I'm telling you, it's freak out time. <laughs> he's, he got these stuff and he's breaking it and he's giving it to the disciples and there's another piece that he broke and then he, break, and he breaks and he, it just keeps coming out of the little boy's lunch and everybody's looking at it you know it's like the magician who pulls that thing out of his mouth the next thing you know he's got a, a size of a bus of fabric in front of him and where did that come from Jesus just kept and you're looking at the little container and then the receptacle and you go and something's happening here and this is why 20,000 people watching this happen it took an impact across the whole countryside because they saw Jesus do the impossible right in front of their eyes as he just kept blessing the bread breaking it off giving it multiplying and multiplying piece after piece after piece and everybody could see what he was doing and it was so high impact that each of the disciples recorded it so the third principle is God uses what Whatever I have. He uses ordinary stuff to do extraordinary things. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. As a matter of fact, I think if you're ordinary and kind of plain, it sets you up more to be used by God than highly gifted people. Because a highly gifted person does something and he feels he did it himself. But if someone is uh, illiterate and as dumb and tongue-tied as I am, speaks, you know that wasn't you. You can't do that. You can't multiply. Ordinary is a good place to be because God can do extraordinary. If anything, it is an extra burden and temptation to be uh, highly talented, which requires God to sometimes take you through a valley of humility so that he can then use you and you understand that compared to him, uh, he's the source and you are the receptacle he pours into you. Now, <laughs> the little boy seems to have done it cheerfully. When they were looking, here, take mine. And uh, I'm thinking of Jesus, and unless you approach the kingdom of God like a little child, little child, yeah, take it. <clears throat> and uh, maybe he preferred peanut butter sandwiches anyways, but take my sardines and do what you want with it. And he wasn't concerned about if I give my lunch to Jesus, what am I going to eat? He just immediately gave it. And I'm telling you, that's the kind of giving 
that sparks a miracle. You can give in a way that will just make you poor. You need to know that. Some people pay their tithe, and what they did was they just reduced their income by 10%. Some people pay their tithe, and God blesses it so that they have more than they ever could have imagined, and the 90% that they have left far exceeds what they would have had had they not given to God what he asked for. You can give, but not always receive. Because the giving has to be done with a pure heart. This little kid says, here, take my lunch. What's the bumper sticker? God loves a cheerful giver, but he will take an offering from a grouch. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not true. God really does not accept that. Why? He doesn't need your money. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your time, and he doesn't want your talent. If you give it grudgingly, he doesn't need it. <clears throat> what he does want is your life, and your heart, your affection, and your faith. <clears throat> and if you give to God because you believe, <laughs> he is going to do something for his kingdom with your meager resources. Now you're in a place where he can do something, and you have just sparked a miracle. He wanted your heart and he wanted you to cooperate with him with a gift that would change everything because he can take an ordinary gift. And if you ever feel guilty, we <coughs> here, <coughs> whenever we ask, <coughs> we try, I try desperately to never use guilt or pressure. Why? And you'll hear me say, you go home, pray to God. <coughs> I can't tell you what to give. If I did, it would be wrong. You are a child of God. You have access to the throne room. He owns everything in your hands. You don't know it, but uh, he owns everything. And so he can give it or he can take it away. And so you work with him on your resource. What, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that's a question only you and God can answer. You never give out of guilt. You never get pressured to give. And you never give unless your heart is in agreement with the Spirit of God. This is a spiritual exercise. Jesus told us, your heart is so closely aligned with your finances, I can tell where your heart is by looking at your finances. There's a spiritual connection there. And so when we give, it frees our heart up to receive from God. The so one verse, it is not part of the message, it's free. And uh, <clears throat> where it says, people are saying, I'm not getting anything out of the word. I don't understand what's going on. All this stuff. Yeah, Jesus said, if you can't handle the resources of this world, I can't teach you the deep things of the spirit life. And you're destined to live a shallow life, the same life year after year. If you want to go deeper with God, free up your heart with cheerful giving so he can do a spiritual miracle inside of you. It's not a coincidence that the word uh, miser has in its root, the word miserable has in its root the word miser. When you don't give, you're basically unhealthy and unbalanced emotionally. It's when you give that you become most free and most like God. You're created in God's image, and you're going to be God-like the way you were created to be. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his son. He gave the best. He gave because he loved. And so if you're going to be like God, you need to give. And if you don't, you're unhealthy uh, both spiritually and psychologically. Uh, <clears throat> that's free too. And, and I'm saying that not off the cuff. I'm saying that is a fact which is provable that people who are uh, unable to give have difficulties in other areas. So fourthly, you need to expect him to multiply what you gave him. Uh, so the little boy gave him a few fish, <clears throat> dried up, wonderful sardines, and four muffins of barley, which is, of course, when I said Jesus was teaching the Amharats, the young ones, or the, the poor people, <laughs> they're the ones that ate the coarse barley bread. This was the lunch of a poor person. 
we will think we don't have enough to give God. That kid could not even imagine in his wildest dreams the wealth that flows through our hands. But he didn't. He just gave God what he did have. And then God multiplied what he had given him. And whatever you give totally to God, he multiplies it, blesses it, and returns it. What was the result of, of that? The, afterwards, they collected 12 baskets full of leftovers. Now, it's not part of this, but this is another freebie. The baskets that they used were large baskets. The word that they used doesn't mean like a basket you place for an offering plate. It means a basket basket. And when they were done with the five loaves and the two fish, they collected hampers of leftover food. God, I don't think, it's not fair to say he shows off, but honest, I think sometimes he does. He, he just, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to take five little things and blow it out the end and, and have 12 hampers of stuff left over. He just wants you to know, I can do exceedingly abundantly above anything that you ask. I can do more than you can even imagine. And every once in a while, he just blows it out of his ears, freaks you out, and shows you his power. And here he took that little basket and turned it in. Now, <laughs> the principle that he's demonstrating here is... <laughs> And it's a universal principle, but you only get to harvest what you sow. You only get to reap what you sow. You only get to get back what you give. So, and this works. If you're critical, you will receive criticism. If you are an encourager, people will just love to encourage you. If you support people, people will support you. You get back what you give. And uh, I, I told you the experiment where uh, they have a, groom, a room of people playing a, a fairly friendly game and they send a competitive person in and the whole room gets competitive. Or if a person comes in and, and sets the example of generosity, the whole room becomes generous. You are the salt of the earth. You are to be creating that atmosphere wherever you are. You are to be changing the world and you are to live the lifestyle that you receive what you give. And when you receive, you receive more than you gave. Uh, you put a, <clears throat> we used to plant corn, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I got to dig the holes, and mom put the corn in, and she only put like one thing in each thing. But out of that one little kernel came a stock with ears on it, and you got hundreds of times what you put in the hole. What you sowed came back times a hundred or so. Here is the lesson. If you are critical, you're going to reap criticism like you never expected. Why does this always happen to me? Well, that's what you sowed. That's what you reap. And generosity, you reap back many times what you sow. Some people are very judgmental. And uh, as a result, they set them up to be judged harshly. In fact, Jesus says, not only that, if you're judgmental down here... I'll judge you harshly. And as I get older, I'm letting more and more people into heaven all the time. <laughs> God is saying, give me whatever you have and watch me multiply it. And Mark is talking about the same thing. He said, all things are possible by God. So he needed, he didn't need anything, but he wanted to participate with the little boy. And we said before, he could have rained down manna from heaven. He could have done whatever he wanted, but he wanted to work with his children. And he wants to work through people. He wanted to work through the little boy who gave his lunch. He wanted to work through the disciples who passed out. And here is a lesson. We sometimes wait for God to do stuff for us that he wants to do through us. We're waiting for God to do for our marriage what he wants to do through our marriage. I'm waiting for God to do for me something he wants to participate with me and do through me. So the feeding of the 5,000 is appropriate for our uh, little community of believers. We live in a county where there are thousands of spiritually hungry people and every week I look up and there is someone else from the county coming in saying, I'm looking to be fed spiritual food. Feed me. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, who's head of this church, is saying, 
feed them. Feed them. And uh, Lee County is, is a big county, and we got one building and one entrance. How are we going to do it? And the truth is that as we look at the next leg of our journey, it's going to require a miracle. I don't know about you, but I always kind of get a little excited when I set myself up for the impossible. Amen. Come with me. You know in your life, God has done the impossible before. Amen. He's done it to me so often, I almost get a little tint of excitement. And here's what's come out of my journey from him bailing me out so many times. Sometimes I do something stupid, he bails me out anyways. Just to show me that he loves me and he knows I'm stupid. So he covers for me. Oh yeah. I have learned an unwavering trust in Jesus Christ because he comes every time. I can't, I can count on one hand the number of times I've lost sleep over problems. Why? He saw the solution before I saw the problem coming. He has the answer. He wants me to go to him. When he can get me to trust him, to tell him about my problem, and ask him to participate, he will step in and you just sit with your mouth open as he works. It's so nice, you go in a hospital, you're praying for people and I've got this phrase so many times, I I shouldn't say this, but I almost expect it to happen. The doctor says, we've never had a recovery like this. We've never seen anybody turn around this fast. We don't know what's going on. It's not a miracle. It's spontaneous remission. So, uh, which is uh, around 1%. Uh, But spontaneous remissions go up with the number of prayers that come. And I've got so that I just have a quiet expectation when I face the impossible I can almost feel God move in to take over, and I relax and go to bed. I can't do anything about it anyways. Leave it in his hands and go to bed. I don't know what you're facing today, but I will tell you, as we look for a miracle, here's what he does. He usually performs a couple of them. As you participate in his kingdom, As you sow into his kingdom, he sows into your life. One of the things that this has happened in every, uh, since 1995, I've probably worked with churches over 20 years or whatever it is. That's longer than that, but the, the same things happen in every church. One thing is, Uh, somebody's going to buy a new car and they say, I'm going to put off the car and I'm going to give that to help the church take the next step. That's happened in every campaign since 1995. Second thing that's happened in every campaign is, (coughs) and every campaign since 1995, someone's getting ready to retire and they say, (coughs) since we're going to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move back my retirement for three years or so, and I'm going to uh, invest in God's kingdom. There's certain patterns that you get to recognize how God works. And I'm telling you over my life, watching God work, when I get a problem big enough that I don't even try to solve it, when I have to trust God, don't laugh at me. And I got to trust God and I got to release it and there's nothing I can do about it. Just go to bed and let him do it. So guys, we are getting ready to do a miracle. I've seen it over and over again. But the biggest thrill is going to come when he does a miracle in your life. 
over the next five or six weeks. Just do your seatbelt on and hang on because stuff is going to happen. And uh, for an old pastor, I'm pretty excited. Stand with me, would you?